Would you open your Bibles to the 29th chapter of the record of Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 29. I think some of y'all are going to be singing that all week long. I know I, I have been, and it's been blessing me. Let me start reading at verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. For I know the plans I have for you. I want to preach on this first Sunday of the year from these words. There's a reason for all of this. You may go to your seats. There's a reason. Today I stand to preach to you the first time in the years of ministry that I've served that my two sons stand at the same time in the church as they now pastor. Walter Jr. and First Baptist Harrisburg, Joshua and St. John Baptist in Gainesville, Georgia. We stand in three separate pulpits declaring the word of the same God. The 29th chapter of Jeremiah has probably one of the best known passages in scripture. For I know the plans I have for you. I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. We quote it. We live by it. And just about all believers claim it. This is my personal verse, God knows the plans that he has for me. We hear the prophet standing declaring it, and we know without a shadow of a doubt 
that he's speaking to us. And this is a word we must hold on to. But my brothers and sisters, I would offer before you get too caught up on holding on, you understand the context in which this word is spoken. What's interesting about this familiar passage, I know the plans I have for you, that is that it is shared, Mike, as an explanation for the crazy reality that the nation is currently facing. They are in exile, living in a foreign land. Their world has been turned upside down. And the prophet of Almighty God has stepped on the scene to announce and to be the bearer of even worse news. Somebody missed that. We quote, I know the plans you have for me. But understand, when Jeremiah utters this statement, he is talking to a people who are living in exile who have been captured and carted off to a foreign land and who God has said, you ain't coming home no time soon. Wait a minute, y'all haven't gotten it. And that the hell you are in, you need to make your home. Oh, I ought to hear a sigh. Because we bounce around. I know the plans I have for you. But the context for that verse is a prophet telling people, don't think that this hell is going to end overnight. I hope you read, heard the first part. That's why I started at verse 4. The prophet starts off by saying, it's going to be a struggle, y'all. There are going to be problems and burdens. You're living in exile. You're living in a foreign land. And the psalmist says this of them, as the poets had said of African Americans in America. They required of us a song. They wanted us to dance. But how can you sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I don't know about anybody else, but I don't like folk to make mockery of me. Y'all ain't feeling me. I, I don't like folk to try to treat me like a joke. Can I get a witness in here? I, I don't like people to try to accentuate my negatives and play to my idiosyncrasies because I know they're making a mockery of me and there's something in my DNA that doesn't take kindly to being ridiculed or made a fool of. If I've got anybody in church today who know you don't play the fool well, just wave at me. Look at somebody and say, my name ain't Boo Boo the Fool. No. No. But yet, Jeremiah says, you all need to get accustomed to this. Settle in. Hunker down. And make the best of your bad situation. Have your children get married. Build houses. Become a part of the commerce. And even pray for the folk who have made you their slaves. Play, pray for the folk who wrecked your credit. Pray for the folk who fired you. Pray for the folk who wrote clauses in your contract and didn't tell you they were there. Pray for the folk who played predatory lenders, who were predatory lenders and got you in debt and forced you into bankruptcy. Pray for them. I, I, how many of you know sometimes it gets hard even being saved to pray for your enemies? Come on, wave at me. It gets, it gets hard at it sometimes to turn the other cheek. I used to think the Bible said turn the other fist, but I, I, my mama corrected me. She said it was cheek. It gets hard, to, but yet the context 
for this verse we memorize, this one we quote, this one we use and recite, we share with others when they're going through something. The context for that is the prophet is telling them, y'all not coming home soon. Life for you not going to be a crystal stair. It's going to get harder before it gets better. So many of us have been where this text sounds. But quiet as it's kept, church, even though this is the first day of the new year and we have a clean slate to write on, this is life. Life ain't no crystal stair. Life ain't all peaches and cream. Out of the blue comes something that shakes us, knocks us down. Out of the blue comes something that sends us into hallelujah glory. Out of the blue comes a crisis. Out of the blue comes a celebration. Out of the blue, we're either singing the blues or singing, bless the Lord, oh my soul. This is life. Something is always hitting. And the prophet says to folk who are in a tough place, learn to live with it. Learn to deal with it. And God has said to some of us in some of the tough things we wrestle with in 2022, learn to deal with it. I, I, I can't speak for anybody but myself, but when I find myself in these questionable places, I find five questions rising in my mind. Why? What's this all about? When is it going to get better? Where did it come from? And who is behind it? If I have anybody here who has asked those same questions, wave at me and nudge the person beside and say, raise your hand and stop lying. Truthfully, when we entered the new year, we still were trying to figure out many of our unanswered questions. Still trying to figure out why some things went the way they went. Why some things happen the way they happen. And I stopped in here today to say, even though the words of the prophet are somewhat discomforting, they bring something, they bring a light to us because what the prophet is trying to get us to realize is there's always a reason, always a reason for the crazy stuff that's happening in our lives. Wait a minute, I, I need to take inventory. Can I see the hands of folk who've got crazy stuff? How many of you got some crazy stuff scheduled? It ain't even hit yet, but you know it's coming. How, how many of y'all can be in that line? You say, it ain't got here yet, but before December, some crazy stuff gonna happen. Come on, wave at me. Wave at me. If the person beside you is not waving, say, listen, I'm gonna give you something. Just touch them. Just touch them. Say, your hand ain't up, it be up by October. Just, just touch it. You don't have any crazy stuff going on. You don't think any crazy stuff coming. I just touch you. I give you five of my items. Because crazy stuff is always, why is the relationship where it is? Why is the job where it is? Why are things so crazy? Why, who is behind all of this? We got more than 99 questions. But Jeremiah in the Old Testament, Apostle Paul in the New Testament, help me understand there's a reason for all of this. And the reason will become clear to each and every one of us. Let, 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 me, let me straighten this thing out. See, y'all are thinking that God's going to give you some empirical data. He's, he's going to speak something that's going to help you make sense of the crazy. No. No. Crazy starts out being illogical. So don't think you are logically going to understand that which is illogically born. Let me bring this plane down. If it's, if it, if it's not based in common sense, what makes you think common sense is going to figure it out? Some stuff just makes. 
Some of y'all need to turn to the person beside you and just give them the wide eye. If there's somebody sitting on the sofa with you, just look at them and go, give them the wide eye. This makes no sense. And there's no need me trying to figure it out. There's no need me trying to rationalize. There's no, there's no need me trying to make sense of why somebody wants to buy a house but doesn't want a job. It, it, it makes no sense to me why you want to lose weight and order three cake. It, it, it just doesn't make sense why you want to be promoted and you can't come to work on time. It makes no sense. So that you will never figure it out. That's not what I'm talking about. Said there's a reason, something you're going to answer the who, what, where, why, and who question. No, 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 no. No, that's not what this is all about. The situations we are facing, and this is what the prophet is trying to get them to see, that when he says, I know the plans I have for you, in connection with the struggles that they're facing, the truth is they need to realize, and you and I've got to realize, nudge somebody besides say, get this, what you are facing is not necessarily coming from God. It'll make sense as we go through the sermon. Everything you are dealing with is not God trying to make your life bad. Everything is not God trying to, but rather, God has a whole set of plans for us. Plans to prosper us and empower us. And wait, you got to get the image. Everything happening in your life is not God trying to do you in. Because God has plans for your life to prosper you and empower you. Y'all still haven't got it. That crazy person in your life, God didn't put them there. You had to have them. I, I, I said this in, in some marriage sessions once. I said, listen, if God put some people together, then he was breaking in new help when he got them together. Because God didn't put some folk together. But God's the only one can get you out. God, God didn't put us on certain jobs. Our greed put us on certain jobs. Our need to be recognized put us in certain places. God didn't put us there. But it'll take God to get us out. God didn't put you in an abusive relationship, whether it's verbal or physical, but it will take God to get you out. The psalmist says, now I need you to understand, God's not behind where you are. The, uh, Jeremiah says, God's not behind where you are because God's plan for your life. Nudge somebody and say, have you checked out God's plan for your life? God's plan for your life is to prosper you. God's plan for your life is to give you a bright future. God's plan for your life is to use you in ways you've never been used before. God's plan for your life is to open up the creative passages of your mind so that you'll dream dreams you've never dreamed, see visions you've never seen, and accomplish things. You, God's plan for your life is to walk through hell with gasoline on your shoes and still make it to the other side. God's plan for your life is to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with whatever evil is coming and declare like Gandalf did in the Lord of the Rings, I shall not move and know that God has your back and will take care of whatever's in front of you. God's plan for you 
is that you will prosper, that you will rise, that you will stand, that you will accomplish, that you will be, that you will be open doors, that you will shut doors, that you will make, that you will lift, that you will sing, that you will glorify, that you will accomplish, that you will defeat demons, banish evil, that you will be able to lift up the mighty name of Jesus in whatever circumstance, situation you find yourself. That's his plan. Flat five with somebody and say, that's his plan. That's his plan. But life, tries all it knows how to stop that from happening. Thomas Axiom 67. The devil cannot stop, and the devil and his imps and the adversary cannot stop what God has for you. Wait a minute. This is the rest of it. But they can stop you from enjoying it. The adversary can't stop what God has for you, but he can stop you from enjoying it. He can mess with your mind so that you can't think straight. He can rob you of the vision of your own future. He can take away the power of your present. He can make you reinterpret your past. The past that his grace is on, the past that his mercy is on, the past that his beneficence is on. He can make you interpret it in such a way that you are still in bondage even while you're walking in freedom. Somebody better hear what I'm saying. The adversary cannot stop what God has for you, but he can stop you from enjoying it. I need you to slap five with the person beside you and tell them the devil is a liar. The devil is a lie. I fought too hard to come out. I fought too many, to, too many nights to come through. I am not surrendering my joy. I am not giving up my peace of mind. I plan to enjoy whatever door God opens for me, whatever window he raises for me, and I refuse to let the adversary have victory over my life. I have come too far, fought through too much, cried too many tears, and as Salisa said, I cried my last tear yesterday. I plan to enjoy the life God gives me. I need about 10 people who know the adversary in 2022 tried to mess with your mind. But I need about 20 people to jump on your feet and say, not this year. Not. I lost time last year. And I can't get time back. How many of you worried about your children, cried over your friends, got upset about this, and God brought them through? God brought them out. You have to decide right now, I'm not losing time this year. I'm not losing energy this year. I'm staying with him. Prophet says, don't get it twisted. Stuff that's crazy in your world is not God's work. No, there's a difference between the hand that you've been dealt and the plan God wants for you. He said, don't ever get it twisted. There's a difference between the hand you've been dealt, the cards you're looking at, and the plan God has for you. You know what? I don't know who I... The Lord just gave me this by revelation. Can I see the hands of every parent and grandparent? I need you, number one, to make sure your children hear this sermon. But number two, you need to say this to them. This line, you need to say to them. You need to take them aside and say this to them. There is a difference between the hand you plan and the plans God has for you. 
God, y'all ain't got it. Look at that child who's struggling, trying to get through some. Look at him and say, there's a difference between the hand you've been dealt and the plans God has for you. Oh, yes, it is. And then quote, because God says, I know the plan I have for you. And the hand you are playing is not consistent with the plans I have for you. My God, the misery, the pain, the struggle is not what God wants for you. It's what life dishes out. We get caught up in. We think we can't make it, but it ain't God's plan. In fact, when life gets like that, and here I go, here's where I want to get. Jeremiah says this, you going there's a reason behind why you got this hand. Well, there's a reason why you playing with crazy. There's a reason why you sitting up at night crying. I don't know how I got into this. That's like one of my sons in ministry said to me once, when he and his wife came to tell me and my wife that they were expecting a child, he said, I don't know how this happened. I said, you really need me to tell you. We ask questions which really are rhetorical. I don't know how this happened. You know how it happened. Most of us know how 90% of what's going on happened. We know how that we just can't believe it did happen. If I'm right, wave at me. And so we wonder, what's the reason for all of this? The reason is not where you think it is. Verse 12. Then you'll call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and bring you back from captivity. Great God Almighty. Jeremiah says, you don't understand, nation. Judah, you've been, you're going into captivity and you're going to be there for 70 years. What, but here's the point. You know, you, you're wondering what is the reason for all of this, you'll answer it when you answer one question. What's going to be your response? What's going to be your response to this? Situation is out of hand. Things are going crazy. Jeremiah said, but these ain't the plan God has for you. That hand you playing, that ain't what God has for you. Life has hit you hard and made you question yourself, your future and your prophet, but the prophet says this, but when it gets bad enough, you're going to call on me. And you're going to come and pray to me. Help me somebody. And I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you seek me with a whole heart. The reason for this is simple. Nudge somebody say, here's the reason. There's a reason why you, you went through, why you're going through, why you're going to go through. Because no matter what life puts on you, Every highway can lead you straight to God. No matter what's happening in your space, no matter what it is, it can, the result of it can be you being drawn closer to God. I, I, I started wondering, why, why are these things happening in America? Why is crime so high? Why is racism so real? And we try to legislate all of this. We try to act like you can write legislation to make people love you. We try to think you can write legislation to make people treat you right. All we can do is put in place by legislation structural requirements in society. But it does not change the heart or the soul. Somebody better hear me. But what the prophet is saying, when things get bad enough, when you're in Babylon and you're marrying there and you're getting your children married off and you're praying for a nation that doesn't even want to treat you right. Isn't it amazing? America wanted us to stand up and sing and to be proud Americans. But when we started bowing our knee to pray at a football game or a sports arena, they wanted to kick us out and call us all kinds of names. What we have to understand, the prophet said is, no matter when it gets bad enough, 
You'll stop complaining. Stop trying to play your hand. You'll stop trying to see if you can win with deuces. And you'll finally start calling on the Lord. In other words, the first step in what misery we are dealing with is to appreciate and appropriate the power of the problem itself to cause all of us to realize we need some help with this and I need to find God in my problem. Most of us did not get saved on a sunshiny day. Most of us came to the Lord when our life was crazy. We came to the Lord when we couldn't figure out which way to go. Am I talking to anybody here? That's when you find the Lord. You seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he may be near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let us return unto the God of our salvation. I tell you, when life gets bad enough, you'll find out why life is bad. Life is bad so you can go back to the God of your salvation. You can go back to the bridge that brought you over. You can go back and say, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. It's the first of the year. It's the first of the year. Let me help somebody understand. Some of the folk we are praying for, it just hadn't gotten bad enough. When it gets bad enough, you'll turn like Hezekiah. You'll turn your face to the wall and say, Lord, I need you. Do I have anybody in the room who's had moments when you had to turn your face to the wall and say, Lord, I need you to make a way out of no way. God, I'm about at my wit's end. I don't know if I can make it. Yesterday or last week, you were trying to walk with your chest out. Talking about, I can handle this, I'll get through this. But sooner or later, it got so bad that the only person you could depend on was God. And what you discovered was that when you sought the Lord, you could find him. Help me somebody. How many of you remember when times were real bad? Some Sundays you would get up and find your way to New Psalmist and it looked like the song, the sermon, the prayer, people sitting beside you was just what you needed. Look at somebody and say, I get my medicine in church. I get my medicine in the house of God. Because when things get bad, you find out that's when you seek him. And if you want to know the reason why things can get crazy, they get crazy so that we realize just how bad we need God. You can't get up in the morning if God doesn't wake you up. You can't get out of the bed if God doesn't send the right motion to your nerves. Somebody better hear me. You can't even eat your food if God doesn't help your elbow to bend. You can't drive your car if God doesn't give you vision to see. You can't work your job if your mind stops functioning. Everything is based in our connection to God. And life has a way of teaching us, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening? Why are these things happening? So I can find God. So I can, how many of you remember when you found him and realized he was already there? Help me somebody. Some of y'all say, I found the Lord then. Yeah, you didn't realize he found you a long time ago. Anybody here know the Lord preserved you going out and you're coming in? The Lord sent angels to watch over you when you were stupider than dirt? The Lord built a hedge of protection around you when you were crazy as a bed bug. The Lord made your enemies your footstools when they thought they had you. Can I get a witness here? But when you sought him out, you discovered he was already right by your side. And you discovered the God who is God, who makes a way out of no way, who helps you play a bad hand and still come out with it. He says, there's a reason 
Because God knows the plans he has for you. Listen, this year when you get upset with your children because they acting stupid, you get upset with your loved ones because they're not doing right, just know when it gets bad enough, they'll find their way back. Wait a minute, let me, let me. Can I see the hands of folk who grew up in church, but, don't raise your hand too soon, but you took a little vacation? <laughs> oh, come on, don't give me that low. You took a vacation, but somewhere along the way, in the words of the song, something got a hold of me. I went to the meeting last night. My soul wasn't feeling right. But something got a hold of me. Can I see the hands of folk who know you took a little vacation? But something happened. And that's when that word came back. Train up a child. I need about three, four grandmothers and five or six mamas to just jump up and praise God that you are seeing the result of training up a child. They may not be perfect yet, but you're seeing them come back. You're seeing them pray. You're seeing them call on God. You're seeing them say, I'm coming to church with you. Somebody ought to realize the reason is we will seek him. Hey God, y'all sit down a minute. I'm, I'm be done in ten. There's there's a second reason. Why is all this stuff happening? And you hear Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you. There's a second reason. For those of you taking notes, write this one down. The first reason is so that I realize all roads lead to Him. I don't care if I'm living large or at the bottom of the barrel. I'm going to wind up at the house of God. And I don't just mean the church house. I'm going to mean at his door knocking. But there's a second reason. God has you and me going through what we're going through, asking the question why, when, where, what, and who, for this reason. So that we can discover the depth of our spirituality. Wait a minute. What do I mean by that? The depth of our discernment and our discipleship. Write it down. Because listen, when you start going through stuff this year, when you're dealing with stuff you can't see, why, why is this happening? So you can discover. You. You. Not her. Not him. Nudge your neighbor and say me. So you can discover the depth of your own discernment and your discipleship. You don't know who you are in Christ until you face your own personal Gethsemane and mount your own Calvary and have to struggle with stuff from every direction. Let me help you understand what I'm talking about. See, the children of Israel are going to be living through a whole lot. They're going to be forced to make the choice to stand in the struggle, accept it, and move forward. But while they're in those places, false voices are going to rise. One of the things I've learned, and I learned it even more during COVID, you've got to watch who speaks into you. I need some folk who know I'm right to just holler. That's the truth. You got to watch. Just because folk wear a dolly on their head, no makeup and no earrings, does not mean they're spiritual. Just because they can put language together for prayer means that they can tickle your ears not impress God. I 
Isaiah, Jeremiah says this. He says, be careful, because this is what the Lord God Almighty says. Do not let the prophets and the diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage that they encourage, you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. Huh, I have not sent them. Let me help you understand something. Any place or anybody you're listening to that does not own Jesus Christ as Lord is a voice you need to turn off. I know some of y'all don't want to hear that because we listen to everybody on the radio, on YouTube. We've got collard green preachers. We've got chitlin preachers. We got cereal preachers. We got fignon, mignon preachers. We got everything you can have. But God sent me in here to declare something. Any gospel that is centered on anything other than the efficacy of Jesus Christ and the salvation of your soul and the liberation of your life is not sent from God. I will not stand here week after week and try to be the self-help preacher and put your relationship back together. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall and he should have stayed on the ground broke, let the sun scramble him up as an egg and let somebody have breakfast. I am not sent to try to hook you up with Mr. Crazy or get you in right relationship with Miss Fool. I have been sent to tell you about the efficacy of the power of the cross of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb, the kingdom of God, the word of faith, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the power of the kingdom, the grace of an amazing Lord, the mercy bestowed upon us to affect the work of Christ. I am sent to tell you how to be more Christ-like. I am sent to preach the gospel, to call the lost. I am sent to tell you that there is a God who sits high and you must have discernment in your life to realize I must hear the voice of God in what I am dealing with. I don't care how saved you are, there's some stupid stuff you got to stop. Because it evidences you don't have discernment. Let me tell you why you want to discern. Some years ago, when Joshua was in school, he took sick. He took very, very ill. And they, my friends in Philadelphia called my wife and I and told us he was in the hospital. And so we got in the car, called his girlfriend, Candace, said, we're going to Philadelphia. See Joshua, he's in the hospital and he's real sick. And he was very ill. I did not know the route to the hospital. I did not know how to get there. So I did what modern man does. Enlightened brothers do. And folk with GPS. I put in the address. I had never, many had never been to the hospital, didn't know where it was, did not know the area. But I put it in the GPS. We are all tense, nervous because he's very, very ill. And we do not know what the outcome will be. We are very worried and concerned. Can I see the hands of folk who know about worry and concern when it comes to your children? Come, come, come on, raise them up high. Raise them high. Let God know you at least cared that day. Come on, wave them. We got in the car and I'm driving fast, under the radar, but fast. GPS tells me, go up here and go over here and go here, and I'm following. I'm going. Trisha's sitting beside me. Candace in the back seat. We pretty quiet because we all wary. We got up and said, turn here. And I turned and rode forward. And all of a sudden, I slammed on the brakes. Because at that point, the GPS told me to keep going. But it was a cliff. That is the danger of not having discernment. I don't know who I'm talking to, 
I'm talking to some brothers and sisters around here who think you can do just anything. No, spiritual discernment will let you know the will of God and the way of God will let you know when something is of God. Oh God, can I preach? Can I preach like I want? Let me help you understand what discernment is. Discernment is the spiritual gift that the Holy Spirit gives you to help you understand and to know the difference between that which is of God, that which is of the devil, and that which is of self. That is the gift of discernment. And if you don't have the gift of discernment, you will get to the cliff and still keep driving. You will get to the cliffs of your own life and go right over the cliff. But discernment will say, slam on the brakes. Discernment will say, don't go any further. Discernment will say, you better back up from here. I need about 20 people in here who can thank God that in the moment of crazy in your life, you discovered what discernment is really all about. And it protected you. It kept you. It delivered you. It lifted you. It was, oh, I need somebody to just bless God for the gift of discernment. Discernment is cultivated when you have the hand you can't play. I'm disappointed. So I'm going to go out and smoke weed. And I'm going to say the Lord is in weed just because the city passed the ordinance? I'm gonna go get drunk. Because you know God know my heart. Or I'm gonna lay down with dogs and then have to wonder why I gotta flee. Discernment will say, you better back up off of this. Discernment will say, you've gone as far as you need to go with this. Discern oh God, I need somebody who's heard God say, this is not what I planned for you. Come on, I need about 20 people in here who know you heard the voice of God speak to you in some great, come on, don't sit here and try to act like you ain't there. I need you to grab the person beside you and say, I heard him talk to me, telling me back up off of this. Get out of this situation. This is not what I have for you. Discernment and discipleship. Why is, there's a reason for everything crazy. There's a reason for everything that's happening in your life. So you can discover the depth of your discernment and your discipleship. Discipleship is not a program. I've been in discipleship. I learned the five assurances. They have taken us no temptation such as it's coming to command. But God is faithful and will not tempt that but about that which we are able and will with the temptation also make a way of escape. I got a hundred on my sword drill. That ain't discipleship. That's quoting scripture. Discipleship is knowing how to apply that scripture when it get tough. When there's something out there you want, you know you better leave it alone. Discipleship is about living like Christ. Does it mean I always like it? No. Does it mean it's easy? No. But does it mean it will hasten the will of God in my life? Yes. And if it hastens the will of God in my life, and since God knows the plans he has for me, those plans will prosper me. Now, prosper doesn't mean give me money. It means make me law. Wait a minute. It will cut, expand all the capacity of my life for everything God is trying to do through my life. I need you to look at somebody and tell him I want him to expand my capacity. I want him to make me able to carry things I couldn't carry last year, to handle stuff I couldn't handle last year, to speak to stuff I couldn't speak to last year. Am I on anybody's street? I need you to grab the person beside you and say, I'm working on my discipleship this year. I'm working on being able to walk like Christ. I'm working on, working on being able to turn the other cheek. 
I'm working on being the light of the world. I'm working on holding my head up high because I believe this. If I live like Christ, the power of Christ will work through me. If I hold his hand, he'll use me as a conduit for his power. How many of you have seen the devil back up off of you? How many of you have seen trouble say, I better leave her, leave him alone for a while? I need some folk in here who are living in your discipleship. And for the first time in a long time, it's a good season in your life. I need about 20 of you to jump up on your feet and tell somebody, it's a good season in my life. Oh, y'all ain't saying it like you mean it. Find somebody else say, it's a good season in my life. God is working stuff out. I see why I had to go through. I understand. I'm done. I'm done. I know the plan I have for you. Plans that draw you to me. I know the plans I have for you. Plans that mean you're going to discover the depth of your discernment and the depth of your, your discipleship then you'll know what spirituality is. But I know the plans I have for you. Going through what you're going through, you ain't seen nothing till you get close to me. And you nudge somebody and say, get this. See, it's one thing to encounter God, but it's something else to experience God. I need about 20 folk I'm finished, but I got to tell you this. Encountering God means showing up where God is and seeing it happen. Coming to church and feeling it and seeing it, but that ain't experiencing God. Let me help you understand something. Experience is a form of knowledge. Experience. My mama used to say, experience is a good teacher. And a fool will learn from nothing else. Experience, I, I, I'm working on a project for something else, and so I had to dig into the experience. We think of going somewhere, doing some this, that, and the other. The, the experience is knowledge. What you experience, you begin to know. God doesn't want you just to encounter him. He wants you to experience him. You can read the Bible from sun up to sun down and get certain understanding, but it's not until you experience God's grace in your life that you really begin to understand what the love of God is all about. Can I talk to somebody? It's not until you mess up and God reaches out his hand and picks, oh God, I'm on somebody's street. God forgives you and then you begin to understand who the God is that you serve. Can I get a witness in here? Is there anybody at a stage in your life where you are experiencing God? You talk with God and you feel better. You walk with God and you live better. You're beginning to understand what it means to say the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my soul. Of whom shall I be afraid? It's only because I experienced him that he touched my heart, that he turned my life around, that I can say in the time of trouble, he will hide me. I need about 30 people today who know you're in a season of experiencing God. You're waking up with God. You're walking with God. You're talking with God. You're serving with God. You're living with God. And every chance you get, you get closer to God. If you're here, then I need you to show him the praise for the life you have, the journey you're taking, the battles you've been fighting, the hills you've been climbing, and tell him, I understand. I want everybody to stand there.
There's a reason. There's a reason for this. Let me help you. There's a reason why you can't solve all your children's problems. Because they got to seek him. And know this. There will come a moment. Because notice what Jeremiah says. And then you will call and then you will call on me how many of you had an and then and that's when you started experiencing him at a whole new level I've had many tears and sorrows I've had questions for tomorrow there have been times I didn't know right from wrong, but in every situation, God gave me the blessed consolation that my trials only come to make me strong. There's a reason. Can I see the hands of folk who know you praying more than you prayed five years ago? Can I see the hands of folk who say you, you consult God a lot more than you did when you first joined the church? There's a reason. Stuff will take you down to calling on him. We standing on the first Sunday of the year. Everything we've been worshiping and we've done in worship this morning leading us to realize it's time to seek it's time to discover and it's time to develop seek him while he may be found look at your own discernment and discipleship and then start experiencing him because he says I'm going to take you home I'm going to bring you back to where you ought to be because I know the plans I have for you. And once you get back, how many of you are trying to live those plans now? The plans he has for you. Through it all. Say it quiet. Through it all. The door. If you're here today, if you don't have a church home, I want to invite you to take the walk today. Come on down this aisle. Give me your hand. Give God your heart on the first Sunday of the year. This is the time to say, I need God in my life. I need God making a way out of no way. Praise God. Praise God. Officers, we've got a sister walking here. Ladies, all right, we got a sister right here. Another one right here. Praise God. God bless your sister. Officers, step right on back here. Come all the way back so y'all can see. Through it all. Come on, my brother. Come on, my sister. Wherever you are, come on, join our sisters and brothers. I got a feeling there's somebody else. Come on, come on. Somebody else, come on, come on. Come on, come on. God bless you. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on. God bless you. Your best event. Won't you walk her down? Won't you walk with the event? Come on, my brother. Come on, my sister. I've had many tears and sorrow. I've had questions for my tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me the blessed consolation. And my trials only come to make me strong. So I say, come on, brother. Come on, sister. This is your moment. Say it, choir. You know, that's
That's why I love, I love this last verse because it says it all. It says it the truth. I thank God for my mountain and I thank him for my valley. I thank him for the storms he's brought me through. You know why, church? Because if I never had my problems, I would know that my God could solve them. I would know what faith in God could do. That's why I say, do it all. Say it, say Oh, I've learned. We're getting ready to go home in a minute. Every head is bowed, every eye closed. If you came to worship today and you don't have a church home, I want to tell you what you're dealing with in life led you here. It brought you here. And the God you will find because he says when you seek me I will be found and some of us are witnesses that when he found us he changed us if you're here today and you don't have a church home maybe you just came to visit you say pastor I'm not a member never been a member or I used to be a member of some church but I'm not now you saw the hands of folk who said they used to be, but they strayed away, but life brought them back. If you're here and you don't have a church home, would you just be so kind to raise your hand in the air? I want to be praying for you today. I want to be praying that God will bless you. Throughout this week, I want to be asking God to stand with you. Just raise your hand up in the air saying, I need prayer, Pastor. I need you. I don't have a church home. Don't be ashamed. God bless you in the back. Don't worry about who sees you. Only God can help you. So just raise your hand up high. And when that help comes, when that help comes, you'll know it's God. I want to say to you, I had to walk down the aisle one day. I took a chance on being a part of God's family joining up with other brothers and sisters who were trying to do better. And this is where it has led me. I want to say to you, my sister, my brother, the Lord Jesus Christ sent you here on the first Sunday of the year so you could experience this and realize this is what you need in your life. I invite you, even as I'm going to be praying for you this week, I invite you to step out and say, I want to be a part of this. Walk on down this aisle. Don't worry about who sees you. Let God bless your life. I'm promising you, he'll do things that will blow your mind. Come on and try him for yourself. Try him for yourself. Somebody's coming down from the load. Praise God. If there's another, you come on. You come on, my brother. Come on, my sister. Come on, take a step. On the first Sunday of the year, why not start out right with God? Amen. Oh, yes, yeah, say that chorus choir. Through it all. Come on, church. Give our new members a big hand. New members ministry. Won't you come? Praise God. Praise God. Give him a hand, sir.
We're getting ready to go home. We're getting ready to go home. Can you just reprise, I'm alive, that chorus for I'm alive. We're getting ready to go home. Tonight the Ravens will play, will play. Let us pray hard. Pray hard. Eat early so you can be awake at prayer time. Can I see the hands of those going to the game? That's what I thought. Too cold for most of us. And if it ain't cold, the prices are too high. But thank God for television. Amen. Thank God for TV. Keep in mind all that's going on in the church, all that's going to be happening. God's going to be moving in some special ways. Remember, Tuesday night is our prayer night. I was going to do a special teaching on Thursday, but we've got some other things happening. People are still vacationing and in trying to get in and out with their children from school. So we're going to postpone that. But I'm just grateful to God to see every one of you in worship this morning. I think I, I see some faces I haven't seen in a while. Look like Ethel and I see up there. I'm just so, yeah, that's Ethel. And amen. Good to see you, Ethel. So many folk are coming back in. So glad to see you back together. You know, we're working with our doctors and all to see when we can begin to move to other areas of restriction to release some of them. But we won't do that until they tell us so. Amen. I said the benediction be given today. So as the instruments play, I want you to think about coming through last year. That's over. Getting ready for this year. And whatever happens this year, whatever comes your way, it has three purposes, three reasons for it happening in your life. To get you on a new highway to see God. To deepen your discernment and your discipleship. And to help you have a new experience with God that'll carry you into this next era of your life. The Lord bless you. Play it, musicians. And the Lord keep you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance round about you. And the Lord give you peace. The Lord preserve your going out and your coming back in. And may you realize that nothing is an accident. You're alive because there's more. And nothing is an accident. I'm alive. Say it quiet. And this is not somebody's hand. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. And this is not an accident. I'm alive. Because it's so I'm alive.
Oh 